hour and we know we'll probably have some students who are finishing up class who will be joining and others joining online. Um, so welcome to our first installment of public health speaker series for uh, this uh, spring semester. My name is Angela Hobson and I have the honor of being the Associate Dean for Public Health and it's my pleasure to welcome everybody here today to this wonderful talk. And um, today we are honored by Rodrigo Reyes, um, Professor and Interim Co-Dean at the Brown School, who is moderating a panel discussion on people, health, and place, building capacity and evidence on the health impacts of built and social environments in Latin America, with three other globally recognized experts in the field who he will introduce momentarily. Uh, Rodrigo's research focuses on built and, built and community environments in public health with particular emphasis on community interventions for promoting physical activity. He has played and continues to play a very important role in international projects such as the Guide for Community in Latin America, the International Physical Activity and Environment Network, the Design to Move Initiative, and the Centers for D Disease Control and Prevention Physical Activity Courses in Latin America. He has published extensively in leading peer-reviewed journals and is also the part of the Lancet Physical Activity Series and the Lancet Urban Design, Transport, and Health Series. Um, this is a really exciting talk because with this talk, the Brown School is formally launching the People, Health, and Place Unit a hub for cutting edge research, coursework, and capacity building centered on the intersection of healthy places and healthy people. Rodrigo is co-directing that unit along with Deborah Salvo, our colleague who is one of our panelists today. And I'll just go off script here for a minute to say, Deb, we miss you dearly and please come back. <laughs> I know you're, you're not, you're still here with us, of course. Um, and uh, this, <laughs> Uh, the unit is headquartered here in the Prevention Research Center and is leading the development of a global research group centered on the intersection of health and place. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rodrigo to lead us in the talk today. Thank you, Angela. Thank you all for being here in the room today, in the Zoom room. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm not going to speak much, just a quick introduction. We are you know, uh, proud to be presenting the product of three years of brainstorming, Deb, Deb and I, Akira, Adriana Akira, and Ali Hauregi have been working on. COVID made us pause a little bit, reassess, but it gives opportunity to really time this with a very, uh, I think it's the perfect timing for us at WashU at Brown School as we advance environmental research, but health and equity as the core element for the strategic plans. I also want to acknowledge that as I speak, there are three major events happening in the world. One, the fallout of the earthquake in Turkey and Syria that is happening now, the recovery and now the rescue of people. And also right now in the Amazon forest in Brazil, there's a major security force operation removing, removing illegal miners that have been undermining native populations, the Anomami people in Brazil, 30,000 30, Anomami people live there with 20,000 illegal miners and they have been dying at scores. So to me, those are two examples of things that are folding right now. They connect climate justice, environment, public health and equity. So it's important, an important topic for all of us and our hub will elevate this, those conversations. Without further ado, let me introduce you to our speakers. Deb Salvo, she, she's a professor at Austin. Yeah. Uh, but hope Hopefully you'll be able to follow my presentation. I will just be providing a very brief five minute overview of what the People Health and Place Unit is meant to be uh, and of why the connections and partnerships with Latin American colleagues like Dr. Ino and Dr. Howdy are so important to us. So we'll just provide a little bit of brief overview on that and then we'll take it over to Ali and Akira to hear their presentations and to get a, a taste of the work that they've been doing around the built environment and health in Mexico and in Brazil over the past few years. So let me just share my screen and please let me know if you don't see it. Um, right. We can see that. Deb. Thank you. Yeah. And you're seeing, you're seeing the slide right now. Do you still see yourself on screen? Yes. Oh, let me see how to minimize this. 
here. Okay. Please interrupt me if for any reason you lose me or something like that. Uh, all right. So as, as Rodrigo said, we are very pleased to formally launch. Uh, we had had a soft launch, but sort of to launch to the greater public within the WashU community, but also uh, beyond, uh, both in terms of the US and globally, the People Health in Place Unit at WashU. So um, why health in place? We know that our residential zip code has much more influence on our economic and health outcomes throughout our, our life course than our genetic code. Uh, so place matters. Of course, one single bullet point is obviously unable to describe the huge amount of evidence that we have. and cities and everything that goes around that influences our health in, in multiple ways. Um, I'm getting a message that my internet connection is unstable. Hopefully you guys can still hear me. Uh, the goal of the People Health in Place Unit, uh, as Rodrigo and I conceived it when I was still back in, in WashU at the Prevention Research Center, is to position the Prevention Research Center within WashU where it sits, the Brown School and WashU at large as national and global leaders in health and place research, teaching and capacity building. And we do want to stress uh, these three important, oh my God, these three important lines of, of work for us. It's not and people health in place and also in global capacity building to enhance research and practice around the area of health in place. Uh, how do we do this? We want to support high quality research, coursework and capacity building activities, but mainly one of the things uh, that we've been really focusing on strengthening and not just by talking to people and by working with people, but through formal memorandums of understanding and formal plans to write grants together, to do research together and to do teaching together is to build these partnerships around the intersections of people, health and place. And we are happy to announce that we are not just the WashU People Health in Place unit. We are part of a conglomerate of multiple units that center around the study of people health in place that exist now in WashU as the Missouri hub that exists in UT Austin. My lab has been named in UT Austin, the People Health in Place lab. So I am the Texas unit for that, that exists nowadays in Mexico with Dr. Alejandra Jauri and in Brazil. And we are hoping to eventually build more partnerships. For us, it's not just a matter of signing people in. Obviously, we want to be able to really build those collaborations in a way that's meaningful uh, and that's equitable. And that's why we're taking it one step at a time. But we are also happy to announce the creation of the International People Health and Place Research Group today. And so as you may have noticed, um, our, our two initial partners outside of, of the US uh, are in Mexico and Brazil. So it's, it's highly focused on Latin America. Why Latin America? It is not just because Rodrigo and I are Latin American and have friends in Latin America and colleagues in Latin America, but we do consider it an important region of interest for people health and place research. A few important facts about Latin America to put the work that Alejandra and Akita will present in, into context. Latin America is the most ur urbanized region of the world with over 80% of people in Latin America living in urban settings in cities essentially. Latin America has experienced rapid demographic and epidemiologic transitions in the past few decades, which have led to what is known as a double burden of disease. We have a huge amount of burden due to non-communicable diseases in the area, but we are still dealing with prevailing uh, issues like undernutrition, infectious disease, et cetera, and everything that comes with that. The region, in terms of its research capacity, has lots of experience in studying and addressing things like undernutrition and infectious diseases because of what used to be the major burden of disease, which were infectious diseases and undernutrition. But uh, it has less so experience for in terms of high level research training for addressing chronic disease prevention management and all of the health behaviors that are connected to chronic disease prevention and management, and certainly for the place related factors. We are, we are catching up. It doesn't mean that we don't have any capacity, but as Rodrigo just pointed out, Akira himself and I probably represent around 70 plus percent of the research around the built environment that's done in Latin America. 
that's not because we are way way better than a lot of other people it's because there's not a lot of other people doing it right uh, so so that's why we think it's an area of high need health and place research as it relates to non-traditional environmental hazards meaning I'm, we're not talking here exclusively about uh th things like you know pollution in, in water pollution in air Another second. No. Mm -hmm. So maybe she'll just carry on and see if Deb can come back. If she cannot come, okay. Yeah, we lost her. So let's continue the program and then Deb will try to return. She's commuting now between uh, Austin and, and Chicago. So that's the reason she's having issues with the connection. So without further ado, I'll pass to our speakers. I think Ali, you're the first, right? I think I am. So uh, should, should I just run right in? Yeah. Perfect. So let me know if you can see my slides, please. Yes, everything is working. Wonderful. So as Deb was saying, um, in Mexico uh, and in general in Latin America, we have very different uh, environmental and built environments uh, from, than what you guys have in the United States and what other high income countries have. So um, with with that we have been collaborating for a while now and today i'm i am presenting some of the results of a project we uh, started before the covid 19 pandemic which was originally a natural experiment where we wanted to estimate the effect of uh, the expansions to a bicycle sharing program we have in mexico city which was then modified uh, to estimate the effects of new bicycling infrastructure, which was implemented in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. I have a whole uh, talk about lessons learned on natural experiments and how to respond to new uh, to, to the challenges of conducting natural experiments. Today, I'm just going to show you some of the results and discuss a little bit about the methods we used, uh, not, not really mentioning what the difficulties of conducting natural experiments to, to evaluate uh, the effects of built environment modifications, but just I just want to let you know that this is a big issue when you are studying built environment modifications. Okay, so without further delay, um, I would like to start by saying that active transportation systems and active urban design is one of the 10 uh, investments that work for increasing physical activity at the population level. And we also know that these um, urban design and active transportation systems may also help to prevent premature mortality and to achieve some of the United Nations sustainable development goals. Um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, cities responded to this unexpected situation and the closures that uh, were implemented globally and in many cities by um, implementing rapid large scale urban transformations to increase access to active transport infrastructure. In Mexico City, these uh, meant that 
new bicycling infrastructure was implemented. And these new bicycle lanes were particular because they were implemented in some of the main avenues of the city, which had never happened in Mexico City. They were implemented in June 2020. So this was around three or four months after uh, the rise of the first uh, the first. Um, wave of the of the COVID-19 in, in Mexico. And also, as I was saying, these were implemented in avenues connecting from nor north to south and from east to west in the city. So uh, this was a, a project that, that was rapidly implemented and these were high quality uh, high quality bicycle lanes dividing the bicycle riders uh, from from the uh, from drivers so what we proposed was to assess the short and long term changes in bicycle ridership resulting from the pandemic and from implementing this temporary large scale bicycling infrastructure in the city. And we also wanted to assess the association between transportation modes and lifestyles, health and quality of life. So for this purpose, we used an area level quasi experimental study. As I was saying, we before the pandemic, we were already measuring uh, these area level outcomes, which I will explain a little a little bit further uh, in in the following slide. But we already had baseline data on bicycle ridership between October and March, October 2019 and March 2020, and then. Uh, during the COVID pandemic, we did two series of data collection, one from August to November 2020, and another one from February to April 2022. I will show you the results of the first two data collection waves. And we also had intervention areas and comparison areas. We had data on re regular bicycle lanes um, collected in the first data wave. And we included additional, additional uh, measurement sites for the new temporary bicycle lanes. Uh, and we also selected some comparison areas. I'm not going into all the details on how we define the intervention areas and the comparison areas. Uh, I could only like to mention that uh, we selected these by the distribution in the in the city and the presence or absence of these of these bicycle lanes. We used to measure bicycle ridership and to, to measure also uh, the, the number of pedestrians in the city. We selected these, these areas. Uh, we select, selected street, street segments, which are basically uh, a little piece of, of a street, which is um, very commonly used in the physical activity research area to measure different a variety of, of outcomes. But in this, for this study, we use the system for observing travel related activity in urban roads, which is an instrument we developed to be able to measure bicycle riders and pedestrians on using the streets. Uh, and we have these observation sites distributed in our intervention areas and our comparison areas measured before COVID and during COVID. We also used an online survey uh, to measure transportation modes before and during the pandemic and to measure other health outcomes and quality of life. Um, and we disseminated this, this through our uh, social network, networks and so on. So what are the main results? Here, I would like to show you the effect of the COVID-19 pandemic or the closures, the restrictions that were implemented in the city on bicycling and walking within areas with and without bicycle lanes. Um, 
On the left of the screen, you can see the effect on uh, bicycle uh, riders. Uh, zero is before the pandemic or pre-COVID, and uh, number one is uh, during the pandemic or the first measurement we have. In red, you can see the street segments which had the bicycle lanes implemented. This includes regular bicycle lanes and temporary bicycle lanes. And in blue, you may see uh, the uh, street segments that did not have any bicycle lanes. And you can clearly, clearly see how bicycle ridership decreased during the COVID-19 pandemic in these street segments that did not have any bicycle lane. And we observed an increase in the street segments where we have uh, either regular or temporary bicycle lanes. It is important to mention that we were not able to have any measurements on where the temporary bicycle lanes were implemented before COVID because as I was saying, these temporary bicycle lanes were implemented in areas that we were not, where we were not expecting these new bicycle lanes. So this is the comparison we were able to, to estimate. And this estimate includes, as I was saying, regular and temporary bicycle lanes. And then we have a similar estimate, but on pedestrians or people walking on the streets and you may see how decreases are observed in the two types of areas, the intervention areas and the comparison areas. We also uh, did a comparison between uh, the regular versus temporary bicycle lanes, there are areas with, with these sort of bicycle lanes. Uh, in the number of uh, bicycle users and pedestrians. Uh, and our reference category, category is the uh, areas without bicycle lanes. And you can see that regular, there was a difference between regular bicycle lanes and no bicycle lanes. And there was also a significant difference between temporary bicycle lanes and no bicycle lanes. So uh, we can see that the effect of the temporary bicycle lanes was very similar to, to the regular bicycle lanes, but uh, still uh, it was not as high as we had expected because these, was in, these were implemented in high uh, occupancy roads. And a similar effect was observed for pedestrians. Finally, from the online survey, we also uh, collected some information on uh, the number of people who started bicycle bicycling, and we were able to identify that most of these of the people who started bicycling during the COVID pan pandemic, uh, one of the main reasons is was that uh, using bicycles. Uh, implied a lower risk for uh, the transmission of the virus and also uh, exercise and physical activity was one of the main reasons. We evaluated the support for uh, the temporary bicycle lanes and most of the participants agreed in a in the implementation of these new bicycle lanes, which then uh, became permanent. So we now have these um, permanent bicycle uh, lanes in the city. And 90% of the new bicycle users reported favorable changes in their quality of life or their health. Uh, the, the main uh, change was improved fitness and money saving, which is very important, but we also were able to identify some changes in uh, health, uh, mental health outcomes. For example, uh, improved stress or better, better mood. Um, and finally, one of the main outcomes that we evaluated was the quality of life, basically how they rated their quality of life. And as you, and as you can see, those using active transportation modes provided better uh, 
quality of li life ratings compared to those using private mo motorized vehicles and also compared to those using public transportation modes, um, which may indicate that people using public transportation modes are living in, uh, in, in conditions that are not favorable favorable for their quality of life, but also that they may be traveling in uh, transportation modes that are serving people in un undignified conditions, which is very common in Mexico. Uh, so before uh, finishing the, the talk, I would like to acknowledge the research team and um, I'm leaving here my content information in case you have any any questions? Thank you, Ali. Thank you so much. We will, yeah. <laughs> oh, we have a clapping audience here. It's very. Yeah, we cannot see them, but I, I could, I could listen. Yeah. <laughs> so we we'll have, we we'll have time for questions later. So uh, thank you so much, Ali. I'll ask Adriano Kira to, to give his presentation. Thank you, Adriano. Welcome. Good to go. Uh, hi everyone. Can 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 you see my my presentation? Yes, we can see and we can hear you. Okay, thank you. So, uh, first of all, I'd like to to thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to be here today. It's it's very special to me to be here and uh, see so many people that I've met some years ago. And it were part of my academic life when I was a PhD student and master's student. So I'm really glad to, he to be here today. Um, so I'm going to present a little bit about uh, the beauty environment and physical activity, uh, specifically among older adults in Brazil. So uh, some of the, the, the studies that we are conducting here in some perspective about what uh, is going on in terms of uh, beauty environment and physical activity in this specific uh, age group. So before I start, I'd like to 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 acknowledge all my uh, co-investigators and students uh, that are part of the research group in physical activity and quality of life uh, that we call GPEC. Uh, so I'm not sure if you, you are aware, but Brazil, unfortunately, has one of the highest prevalence of inactivity in the world. So we are not we are not doing very well, even though we have a really beautiful natural environment. It seems that it's not enough to promote physical activity. Uh, so we at this moment huge for a lot of things among them strategies to promote physical activity. So another important thing that I'd like to highlight is that, uh, as you can see, regardless the sex or type of physical activity and another, other variables, the older adults tend to be the less active age group. And this specific age group, uh, it's, uh, it's increasing in terms of proportion. So as, as you can see, uh, Latin America, it's uh, increasing the proportion of older adults very, very fast. And uh, in a round of, by 2050, we will have a round of 55% of the populations uh, being older adults. So it's, it's very important to understand uh, how this, the, the mainly health behavior of these age groups, mainly considering to keep their quality of life. Another important uh, consideration that I think that, it, that it's, it's important to have in mind, and the Deborah just mentioned some minutes ago, Latin America. It's uh, one of the, the, the regions in the world with the highest prevalence and proportion of uh, population residing in urban areas. So 
uh, considering these uh, forecasts in terms of 30 years, we have a lot of people being uh, over 60 years old, living in urban areas and being inactive. So we, it's, it's really important to, to act right now and understand what kind of intervention we could do to avoid this kind of situation, improving their quality of life and reducing the likelihood of a lot of disease. So when we think about uh, interventions to promote physical activity, uh, it's important to consider that physical activity is done in a specific place. So uh, it's not hard to realize that uh, environmental and social variables, it's a very promising strategy uh, to, to reach these people and, and uh, allow them to be active. But when we think about uh, research in Brazil, specifically uh, in terms of environmental variables and physical activity in older adults, uh, we are conducting a systematic review in one of the preliminary results. It's that we already have 10 studies, that it's a good number. But uh, even though 10 studies, it's, it's some evidence, and we already have some evidence of what is related to physical activity among this age group. If you really go and see uh, where this kind of study comes from, good part of these 10 studies comes just from two or three studies. And I would say that three or four of these studies it, it includes Professor Ross Brownson uh, and Rodrigo Reis and Alex Florin, and that's all. So uh, basically we have some evidence, but they are not very representative of the, the, the real situation in Brazil. So trying to uh, improve the amount of uh, and knowledge uh, of the of how the bio environment can can be related to physical activity in this in, in other adults. So we have developed two different projects that are uh, uh, related to each other. They are complementary. And one, uh, I'm not going to present the, the results of this part of this project. It's a, a quantitative approach. Uh, with a sample of 620 other adults uh, from 64 census tracts selected according to walkability and income of the census tract. And we evaluated a lot of variables, including sociodemographic, physical activity, quality of life, perceived environment, and, uh, and uh, some uh, more precise uh, measures as of physical activity as a accelerometer and GPS in a subsample uh, of uh, 320 other adults. And from this uh, sample, we select around of 67 other adults to conduct a more qualitative approach. And in this case, we, we used uh, uh, the base uh, called the citizen science, that's a participatory approach. And in this case, the Our Voice project, that is, it's, uh, which we are part of, uh, of this project, they conducted this, uh, this uh, approach in, in four steps. The first, the other adults would be considered the citizen science uh, that it would assess the neighborhood and then we would help them to identify common teams and uh, discuss the, the, the issues, the problems that they have found, and then discuss this, these issues and teams and try to identify solutions and priorities, and then try to put them um, close to the local policymakers who could actually uh, make those changes, make it real. So unfortunately, unfortunately we could, couldn't have uh, gone through this whole process. So we stopped it in, in the step one. And to do this kind of thing, we have used uh, uh, an app that could be installed in, in a, a tablet or uh, a, a smartphone. 
and it's called a Stanford Discovery Tool that allowed the older adults and uh, who want to use this app to take pictures and record recording uh, messages about to why they, they took the, that picture and it uh, identify especially uh, especially uh, this this picture so we can we can uh, just specialize the 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 barrier or facilitator identified by the older adult. So here is just an example of this kind of approach and how we help the these the participants to take pictures. So the first first uh, evaluation was about the experience and uh, feeling about using this kind of app, mainly considering that the, the older adults uh, in Brazil are not uh, very familiar with uh, um, some kind of technologies. Uh, so when we, we asked them to, how, how was the, the perception uh, of using this kind of app, basically we, we have very good results. They, they, they do not, uh, didn't uh, got nervous, uh, didn't get nervous or thought that it was dangerous. They would use uh, for a longer period of time. They thought that it's comfortable and our indicator. So it seems that this, this app is uh, uh, acceptable and useful for this kind of uh, age group. Uh, among the, 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 the results, we classify I the pictures and and uh, voice recording about the kind of 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 barriers. So basically, most of the barriers that uh, they reported were considered functional. Uh, as here, for example, I took this fo this photo because there is no sidewalk, so uh, it, it's, it's the function of the environment that do not allow them to be more active. Uh, and safety and aesthetics, uh, we consider that it's it's something something important to this age group. When we look at the functional barriers and some uh, subcategories, so we identify that walking surf surface it's it's something very important to them. So uh, here it's an example of a, a photo. It's completely crooked. Uh, how can walk here? You need to be careful, stay alert. So that's the, how they, they, they perceive in the, the problem, the issues that this kind of uh, age group uh, see. So basically, uh, we have uh, a lot of progress during the last years in terms of building environment and physical activity among years of those. We still need more studies, mainly considering that those studies available are concentrated in just a few projects. The capacity building is something that will allow us to have more research and not just more research, but better researchers, uh, research and researchers to conduct these this kind of investigations. So using mixed methods and more uh, uh, other kind of uh, uh, methods that, that are not cross-sectional studies. And we, need some strategies and it will probably need more people study uh, how to implement this kind of evidence to make this evidence uh, true for this population. So once again, thank you very much for your attention. It's very nice to have you here and uh, meet a lot of good friends again. Thank you, Adriano. Thank you so much. Maybe you, you also have Plex. Oh, thank you. Before we move to Q&A, uh, Deb and reconnected. So Deb, you wanna come back and just finish up the, the last minutes you were presenting? Yes, yes thank you. I, I apologize for the situation, the Wi-Fi dropped here. Um, let me share my screen again. I was almost done, but I do want to make sure to finish. <laughs> Sorry about that. Asking for time for them. Right. Um, Somebody needs to mute uh, the, mute the. Uh, there's going to be a, there's going to be. It may be some noise that you're picking up from here. Oh, okay, <laughs> right, right. No, just go. So go, I'm go sorry. On. Yeah. Uh, are you seeing my slides right now? Yeah, just put on the presentation mode. Okay. Do you see it in presentation mode now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Great. 
Uh, so I'll just redo the slide. Uh, I think I got through most of it, but just to make sure that we didn't miss any information. So I was just, you know, this was supposed to be the preamble and the context of what you were about to hear from Akira and Alejandra, who are based in Mexico and Brazil, in terms of why Latin America has an uh, immediate priority in terms of our partnerships for the International People, Health and Place Research Group. Uh, Latin America is the most urbanized recent region of the world with over 80% Latin Americans living in cities. And it's undergoing a very rapid demographic and epidemiological transition uh, and dealing with the double burden of both non-communicable chronic diseases and still undernutrition and infectious diseases being a huge burden. What that means is that we have actually in, in the Latin American region, a lot of experience and really good training program and really good people uh, that, that have high capacity for research, meaning PhD level trained people uh, and that, that are specialized in addressing topics like undernutrition and infectious diseases. But we are still catching up in terms of research capacity for addressing chronic disease prevention and management. And this includes uh, a lack of capacity in particular for areas like physical activity research, as you, as you heard today, but also for built environment type research as it connects to chronic disease prevention. <clears throat> so, Health and place research um, is uh, as it relates to chronic disease prevention management, so to health behaviors um, you, that we know are preventive um, of chronic diseases food? like physical activity, healthy eating, smoking, etc. Health and place research with relation to these types of outcomes is still pretty nascent in Latin America, but there is emerging research capacity, as you just heard from two of the leaders of this field in our region right now. Uh, what this does mean is that we have few academic programs that are specializing in this area of research. So you know that at, at the Brown School, uh, we have, and I still say we because I'm still, I'm still connected to the Brown School, um, we, we have a specialization in urban design, uh, and we have a lot of people that are doing work in the developed environment and health in many aspects, uh, but that is not necessarily the case in most countries in Latin America in terms of opportunities for training uh, in this field. At Alejandra and Akira are, are, are among the leaders in terms of programs for this. This also means that there are very few people with PhD level training in the region and doing this type of work and therefore low research output. This is not just important because uh, we want metrics and we want a lot of research productivity coming from that area for the sake of, of having those numbers, but this means that we have very little locally relevant evidence to implement policies and programs that can create healthy, equitable, and sustainable places in Latin America in ways that will actually work for the local context. Most of the evidence that we have in this field right now comes from the, the so-called developed nations or the high income nations like the US. So with, with this uh, international initiative, we are trying to help build that capacity, but also to do uh, important meaningful research together. I just wanted to close, and this was going to be the introduction of Akira and Alejandra. Sorry that it's all upside down now, but to close by acknowledging the core members of the International People, Health and Place Research Group, of which the People, Health and Place Unit within the PRC at WashU uh, is, is, one of, is one of the leading hubs. Uh, so obviously Dr. Rodrigo Reyes, with whom I co-founded the WashU People, Health and Place Unit, and that is now helping me in, in to be your head, uh, Austin based People Health and Place Unit. And obviously, Dr. Alejandra Jauri and Dr. Kiraino in Mexico and Brazil that are leading these efforts uh, as part of this international partnership. And I did want to acknowledge Anya O'Connor, uh, our People Health and Place Unit Manager, uh, Research Manager. Uh, for WashU and for the international initiative, who is always behind the scenes and, and, and doing a lot of work around everything you're seeing. I invite you to visit our new website that is now live uh, and please be in touch. And I'll stop sharing now. Thank you, Deb. Thank you so much. And thank you for dealing with all these challenging situations. Before before we have q and I also want to acknowledge you know, Ana, Ana Luisa, who is a visiting scholar, Fulbright scholar, who has joined the, the unit as well. Courtney Shaw, who joined us uh, two months ago, maybe. And so we're expanding a little bit. I also want to acknowledge the MPH leadership team, Angela, Ragni, Jonesy, you are super. And 
Tammy for helping us setting up the MOUs. The global office has been nothing but supportive. So thank you, Tammy, as well. And a special, a special thank you for the comms team who has helped us to put this together. So we have an amazing community here at Brown. We couldn't be happier than, than we are now. And uh, one last, uh, you know, thank you note, and Ross Brownson for really, you know, nurturing the, supporting us and mentoring us through this process. So I know you probably are still connected, Ross. Thank you so much. Okay, so do we have any questions? Uh, the panelists are still on. Oh wait, we, we, let's use the microphone. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for all of the panelists and uh, Debbie, Deb, Deb, great to see you even virtually. I, it seems like the background is at airport lounge, but uh, um, wonderful to see your continuing engage and show your leadership at WashU and uh, and at UT Austin. Um, so I want to I want to ask a question because I, this uh, riding bicycles and uh, it comes very close to me because I I just biked over from home to work and I do this pretty much every day and uh, so I want to know this uh, collaboration international. I'm I'm so glad to see there's a global interest. Um, about the people, health, and the place, and it's a, a wonderful initiative. So I want to ask: this collaboration can can uh, as a local person who's using bicycles in St. Louis, how can, can you just uh, articulate the benefits of um, your research to the people who are actually living in St. Louis, and how your research and maybe particularly Rodrigo, you can um, elaborate a little bit. Just uh, what, how can we benefit? as the, the residents in St. Louis. Let me take a look with Deb. I will do a quick answer and I'll let uh, Deb uh, say what she wants to say. Well, if you think through St. Louis uh, has similar challenges that we see in Latin American countries. Just think about the Del Mar divide, North and South St. Louis, and all the access challenges we have of infrastructure, you know, climate justice, environmental justice. The, the issues are not quite different. You no know, poor resourcing, you no know, spatial segregation, Poor, poor, uh, uh, a very inexistent equity lens when you talk about when you talk about zoning, planning, and transportation. So I think we can. It's a bidirectional process. You no, know, whatever we are learning in St. Louis can inform uh, communities in Latin America. And the similar, the similar way, we can, what we learn in Latin America can inform communities in, in St. Louis. So I see it as you no, know, we 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 say we name these days like local, you no know, global and local are really intertwined, right? I mean, I'm a living example of a Brazilian living in St. Louis. I can bring my experiences here and bring my experience from St. Louis back to Brazil and so on. Deb, any, anything that I missed? Uh, okay, we, we lost you again. So before you come back, Ross, you have your hands up. You're muted, Ross. Now you hear okay? Yeah. We have Austin, okay. we have Mexico, we have Brazil. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Okay. I think Ross. Deb Deborah, were you saying something? Yeah. Uh, yes. Could, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, sorry. Uh, I'll go back. So, one of the goals that we have with the People Health in Place International Research Group is to really have impact at the local, regional, and national levels wherever we're working and at the global level. Uh, in, in terms of what that means for the type of research projects or, or partnerships that we engage with, uh, that is reflected in, in our immediate research. So uh, some of you may be familiar, Rodrigo and I and Ross, uh, Amy Eidler and others, we, we just finished a project, a three-year collaboration uh, with Forest Park Forever doing an assessment uh, of how the park is utilized, but specifically with the goal of coming up with recommendations to make the park more accessible to diverse users, given, given that the demographics that we see at the park don't currently reflect the demographics of the St. Louis area. Uh, connecting back to cycling, you know, we are planning to have projects, hopefully that, that touch on all the locations where the hubs are based and hopefully to recruit new hubs. But we want to make sure to do that in an equitable manner, not just for the sake of somebody signing someone off on our website and that's it. We want to have projects in, in each of these places. So more to come. All right, thank you, Deb. Ross, on to you. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, first of all, I want to thank Rodrigo and Deborah for leading this effort. It's so exciting to see this. I guess we had a soft launch. This is the big launch and making all this official and getting this going both for research and training. And thank you, Alejandra, for joining and Akira. Great to see you from so far away in southern Brazil. Um, I think like, well, so just exciting to see this this moving along and anything we can do to, to help us will be great. Um, I think my question, and I knew this answer some years ago, but when you think of the research going on in the built environment in Brazil and Mexico, both the kind of research that both Alejandro and Akira presented, um, how my question is about external validity. How much that we're learning in Brazil applies directly in Mexico and back and forth in different areas of the built environment, whether it's older adults or youth or whatever segment we're talking about. Like how how well how well are we understanding external validity right now? I will let you guys weigh in first. Does, does anybody want to tackle this? Adriano, Ali, Deb? I mean, I can jump in. I, I am sure Deb will or Akira may have some additional uh uh, feedback or uh, response to that, but um, we do know that Latin American cities are more similar uh, than what the cities in Latin America are compared to other cities in high income countries or the US or Australia and so on. Um, uh, there are many commonalities that may be explained. I don't know if you guys sitting in uh, there in the classroom, is that a classroom? It's too nice to be a classroom, but anyways. Um, if you have been to, to Latin America, to Mexico City, to Bogota, to um, Sao Paulo, the cities are, are noisy, are loud, there's a lot of traffic. There's a lot. There are a lot of things going on in the cities, um, which is not actually what happens in common cities, for example, in the U.S. So we have that. We have poverty. We have inequalities. So I, from my perspective, the findings and the interventions that are. Um, the built environment modifications that are implemented in, for example, uh, Sao Paulo, in Colombia, or in other cities in Latin America, may be, um, may be talking or speaking about what we could see in other Latin American cities or Mexi Mexico cities, Mexican cities. But, there are many cultural differences, even within Latin American, Latin American cities that need to be uh, addressed. So I could say in like a oversimplifying the question that Ross uh, just mentioned, I would say that there is some external validity for Latin American cities or very highly urbanized, highly dense cities. But then again, it's not like a uh, hundred percent valid for uh, all the Latin American Latin American cities. So yeah. All right, all right, Deb, you want to take a long on that? Yeah, I mean, Ale, Ale, I think said it uh, really well. There's a lot of common common structural factors, both in terms of how the cities are designed. Uh, most cities in Latin America emerged and grew. In, in colonial times. So we have a shared history of colonialism, of, of European and of Latin colonialism, obviously, of uh, Port Portugal and, and Spain. Oh. Third language were a very close one. So we can even speak Portuño in a combination of Spanish and Portuguese. Uh, culture is different, uh, but it's still closer than, than what we see from. is generated. Yeah. We're losing oh, you. I'm sorry. I think we could follow you for most part. I think I think one element that I will bring uh, bring that has not been mentioned Ross is you know when when communities that are struggling with like poor resources or lack of resources they tend to rely on social cohesion 
and social supports within communities. So that's something that's quite translatable for me, the, the external elements. It's the interactions between built and social environments that we see in Latin America could inform communities in the US. I think we have not explored that in depth neither in Latin America, neither in the US. One of the criticisms Deb and I have been having for years now in built environment research, it has emphasized heavily on, built, on the built environment component. It has de-emphasized the social interactions with built environment. So to me, that's one of the, one of the, one of the elements that I think could increase external validity especially in terms of bringing translated evidence from Latin America to U.S. I think oh, we have yeah. To, yeah, and if I may You're... jump in uh, for one final thing, one thing that we are finding with other colleagues in regions beyond Latin America, so colleagues in India and China, for instance, they're reading our papers and some of the things that we're saying about these interactions between the social and built environment and telling us this is so applicable to cities in our countries. So other low and middle income country cities with similar characteristics and similar shared history of colonialism, uh, of overpopulation, density, et cetera, poverty, inequalities. Uh, so maybe the generalizability is not going to be so much for, for the high income country settings, but it seems that across low and low income country settings, there is a certain element of general. Thank you, Deb. I'll let Akira weigh in. Sorry, Deb, for cutting you, because then we are about time. Akira, final comments. Thank uh, you. Very fast. In, in terms of, uh, I think that we have some, some, some researchers and some results, and they, they do have good uh, external validity, but I think that we we do not have enough studies that cover all the the situations and characteristics in Brazil and Latin America, even inside Brazil, if you consider it. So we we still have uh, have we still need evidence from small cities that it's not large cities as Curitiba, São Paulo, and the, uh, probably the results from Curitiba and big cities are not applicable to this kind of context. So. I think that it would, would help to have a, a more representativeness of results. So then the external body could, could cover right. better uh, our context. Cool. I think there are two things here. One is external validity within Latin America, external validity between North and South. Those are two things that I think, I think Ross was sort of provoking us to think about that. We are about one minute to finish. So I'll let Angela, call this off but before before she let us go thank you so much please visit the website stay tuned contact us if you want to be you know in this conversation and let us know what are new ideas exciting ideas and you know possibilities we can build together thank you so much it was a pleasure to have you all here i wish you a lovely day angela on to you yeah. Thank you. I won't keep you. I just want to say thank you to everyone who's here and thank you so much to our panelists and everybody who's doing so much hard work to get the People Health in Place unit going. It's exciting work and we will all be um, watching closely as it develops. So thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, and have a wonderful day.